live from Ottawa, Encounter 84. An exchange of views by the leaders of Canada's three major political parties on the issues of the federal election. The moderator is the distinguished academic, the principal of McGill University, David Johnston. Good evening. Tonight, the leaders of Canada's three major political parties will confront one another on the issues which now concern the nation. This encounter has been arranged by the parties and the pooled efforts of the CBC, CTV, Global, Radio Canada, and TVA. The parties and the broadcast organizations have agreed on the following format. Each leader will make a three-minute opening statement. The order of speaking has been drawn by lot. The first speaker will be the leader of the New Democratic Party, Ed Broadbent. The second speaker will be the Prime Minister and leader of the Liberal Party, John Turner. The third will be the leader of the official opposition and of the Progressive Conservative Party, Brian Mulroney. After these opening remarks, there will be a debate period divided into three 30-minute rounds. In the first, Mr. Turner will face Mr. Broadbent. In the second half hour, it will be Mr. Broadbent and Mr. Mulroney. In the final round, Mr. Mulroney will face Mr. Turner. In each of the three rounds, the leader who is not participating will remain at his place. We also have in the studio the senior correspondents from the three networks, David Halton from the CBC, Bruce Phillips from CTV, and Peter Truman from Global. Each round will begin with a question from this panel to one of the leaders, and the journalists will be asking questions when appropriate during the evening. The three journalists have worked together to develop the questions and the themes which will be raised. After the three rounds, each leader will have an opportunity for closing remarks, speaking in the reverse order of the opening statements. We've kept the formal rules short and simple to encourage the leaders to engage fully in discussion with each other. In the rounds, they have the right to reply and counter-reply to any answer given in response to a journalist's question. The leaders may also ask questions of one another. The moderator's role is to ensure that the time limits are respected, that the principle of equal time is fairly recognized, that the proper order is followed, and that opportunities exist for questions. The participants have agreed to refrain from speaking when I intervene and to accept my judgment as to when their comments should be terminated. We begin with the opening remarks of Mr. Broadbent. Today, there are thousands of Canadians who earned more than $60,000 a year who haven't paid a cent in income tax. This is because the Liberal government accepted the Conservative policy of introducing special tax loopholes that benefit particularly the rich. The rich in Canada do very well because of Liberals and Conservatives. However, there is another Canada, that of the majority. There's the miner who pays a lot. There's the logger. There's the bank clerk. There's the fisherman. They all pay plenty of taxes. There's even the pensioner who must pay a tax on her pension check. And believe it or not, an unemployed man or woman must pay tax on the unemployment insurance check. The New Democratic Party is the only party in this campaign that's saying it's time in Canada that everyone, including the rich, paid their share of taxes. Consider women. Women in our country earn, on the average, 60% of the salaries of men. Women, if you look at the poor pensioners in Canada, constitute the vast majority of the poor. I have a daughter. Many of you have a daughter. In fact, most of you out there tonight watching are women. And I say that the women in Canada have waited long enough for equality. It is now time to act. Consider also unemployment. There was a report out of Paris yesterday that is a moral and economic disgrace for our country. It says that unemployment in Canada for the next 18 months is likely to remain at more than 11 percent. A Conservative Party document released a couple of weeks ago says that the Conservative Party is going to accept the same kind of high levels of unemployment into the future. Well, I say, and New Democrats all across Canada say that's unacceptable. What's needed are not new ideas. We have lots of new ideas. Things can be done for small businesses, 
Things can be done for the young. Things can be done for key sectors. Things can be done to bring down interest rates. What's needed in this country of ours is political will. The Japanese have it. The Swedes have it. The Austrians have it. And they have virtually full employment. There's one government in Canada, and that's in Manitoba, that has that will. And it's the only government in Western Canada that's seen a reduction in unemployment in the past year, down 2.5% in one year. In fact, unemployment among the young in Manitoba is the lowest in Canada, and that's a province with limited resources. Well, what's needed then for unemployment, as with other questions, is a national will to do something, and we have it. Briefly, I have stated some of our concerns as we understand the concerns of the majority. We need new Democrats in Parliament after September 4th to fight for the ordinary person. There's something special about ordinary Canadians in this country. They make the country work, and we must never forget it. Thank you, Mr. Broadbent. We now turn to Mr. Turner, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On March 16th, I returned to public life after an absence of nine years. I returned because I had a profound conviction that changes were urgently needed in the way our government worked and that I had a contribution to make. I insisted that this debate be held as early as possible because I think it is important that Canadians understand right up front what this election is all about. This election is about the Canadian economy. It's about jobs, now. It's about our social security and our confidence in the future. It's about our families, our homes, our farms, our businesses. It's also about social justice and peace in a brutal world. And so, in the end, what this election is all about is competence, experience, skill, confidence, and trust. In a word, leadership. To survive in this fiercely competitive world, our country must call upon the best from each of us. We will have to marshal all our skills and experience to make the tough decisions ahead. And to bring this kind of leadership to Canada, I need your help. I need your support to set a new direction, to introduce the new policies which will put this nation back to work, deal with the national debt, battle high interest rates, and protect our homes, farms, and businesses, while at the same time maintaining and even extending our social security system. Our present level of public debt is too high. 33 cents of every tax dollar goes to pay interest. Canadians should not and will not allow anyone to recklessly increase this mortgage on our future or to place a higher mortgage and debt upon our children's future. My proposals will attack our economic problems without adding to the level of debt. And what I say to you will be the same as what I said to Liberals during the leadership campaign. I will not say one thing to Liberals and something else to you. Tonight and over the next six weeks, I will set out my vision of this country in concrete terms, a vision which includes as goals remedying the economic injustices suffered by the women of Canada and giving our youth a first chance for a job. I also seek to make Western Canadians true partners in our Confederation. That is why I'm running in British Columbia seeking a seat in Vancouver Quadra to show that I am serious. I am confident in our future, and I will ask Canadians to share that confidence with me on September 4th. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Finally, we will hear from Mr. Mulroney. The election of September 4 is a crucial one for Canada. The election is about change, not cosmetic or superficial, but true responsible change which will benefit Canada and all Canadians. Change is the one event in our lives that brings new hope, suggests new options, brings alive new possibilities, and this election is all about those new possibilities. 
and it's about a new day for Canada. For more than 20 years, almost without any interruption at all, the Liberal Party, the Liberal Party has held sway here in Ottawa, has exercised the equivalent of a monopoly on politics and political development here in Canada. And their legacy for over 20 years has not been a happy one. Embittered federal-provincial relations, the exclusion of Western Canada for two decades, almost two decades from the decision-making process, the souring of relationships with our traditional friends and allies around the world, declining productivity, the falling dollar, rising interest rates, historically high unemployment, to which we now add that cruel tragedy, the unique one of youth unemployment brought about particularly in the last number of years. Only minimal progress in the cause of the advancement of equality for women, notwithstanding the speeches of certain liberals, and the greatest deficit in our history. This is the sad heritage that comes when there is no change in people or policy for such a long period of time. Where one party is so entrenched in office that it's been here so long that it doesn't want to change. And that's why September 4 is so important for all of us. Canada is a magnificent country of absolutely remarkable potential. Our policy is to make Canada strong again. Our policy is to liberate the creative forces and energies in this country, to welcome investment, to encourage innovation, to stimulate growth and to create those thousands of new jobs that we need by expanding enterprise in a climate of optimism and trust. Our commitment is to manage your tax dollars prudently, to treat taxpayers fairly, to harness the entrepreneurial spirit of this nation, to ensure dignity and economic security for our elderly and disadvantaged, and to work for cooperation at home and at all times seek that noble peace abroad. These are difficult times, and we don't pretend to have all of the answers, but we have listened and we have learned, and we have new people with ideas and programs and a deep commitment to Canada and a deep commitment to you and to your welfare. And we believe that together we can bring new hope and new prosperity and a better day for Canada. Thank you, Mr. Mulroney. Now that we have heard the opening statements from all three party leaders, we begin the first one-on-one -on -one encounter between Mr. Turner and Mr. Broadbent. Mr. Mulroney will not participate, but will remain at his place. Mr. Halton, you have the first question, please. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Gentlemen, this campaign is taking place at a time when a great many Canadians are frightened and insecure about their economic future. And I think it's fair to say very worried, too, that that concern is not being adequately reflected in the election campaign so far. Mr. Turner, I'd like to start by asking about clearly the biggest issue, the one and a half million Canadians unemployed. Now, you've made this a top priority in promising jobs for the past four months, but you've been consistently vague about how much you hope to reduce unemployment, how soon, by what means, and at what cost. Could you start tonight by giving us some of the answers? Well, there are no, uh, there are no quick fixes to what is a very desperate problem, not only in Canada, but internationally. I said, first of all, that we have to re restore confidence in this country confidence in ourselves, confidence so that uh, businessmen and women will invest again, and by investing again, expand, and by expanding, rehire, and rehire our men and women. I'd say, too, that we have a structural job to do to make us more competitive in the world. Other countries are giving us a rough time, and we've got to modernize and uh, rationalize our major industries like steel and automobiles and uh, major structural components in our economy some of our major exporters like mining and forestry. We have to rely particularly on small business to uh, lead our, our, our recovery. Small business is our largest employer, will be our largest employer. The best way for women to enter the, enter the workforce, the best way for young people to become involved. And I've said we've got to continue to simplify the tax system there. We've got to gear the cap tax system so that liquidity in the first early years allows a business to get off the ground, lift the burden of regulation, Training and retraining for our workforce needed to meet a technical, technological age. I will be announcing in, in a few days a national apprenticeship program for our young people. I talked about it for the, for the past three months during the uh, leadership campaign. And uh, I will do that uh, within the, uh, the limits of the, of the, of the current uh, national debt. We will find the money from, from other programs and from reallocating. Education 
making sure that our educational system in conjunction with the provinces meets the needs of today and tomorrow and our moderator knows what I'm talking about uh, all these all these efforts will be uh, will be will be necessary I'm not going to say as uh, Mr. Mulroney has said that uh, once in government 200,000 new jobs will be found uh, it's going to take uh, more than uh, more than uh, just rhetoric to, to get us back to work Broadman. Well, I'd like to pick up where Mr. Turner left off. He, he said it's going to take more than rhetoric to get Canadians back to, to work. I agree entirely, but all I heard from Mr. Turner is precisely rhetoric. I heard every kind of general cliché phrase that I used to read about in textbooks, but now I hear increasingly from Mr. Turner and from others. Mr. Turner has said that we need to restore confidence. Well, that's a wonderful old phrase. Uh, Governments running for office in British Columbia used that phrase recently, and the, the social credit was re re-elected, and we've seen nothing but uh, deterioration of that economy since they came in. Saskatchewan, a conservative government, ran on that theme. A uh, party sought office. They, they came in with the same cliches. Unemployment has gone up. And Mr. Turner mentions, uh, for example, the steel and auto sectors need restructuring. Well, that's, I find that bizarre, frankly. The steel industry is one part of the private sector in Canada that's running very well, very efficiently, very competently. The automotive sector is our major exporter this year, producing thousands of jobs. There are two sectors I frankly don't think much needs to be done about. But I do think something ought to be done for young people. We have been specific uh, as recently as last week in Winnipeg. I announced on my behalf of my party a major program that wouldn't provide jobs for all young people, but would provide over a year 100,000 jobs uh, that would encourage people, I want to say this too, young people, not only to do work in the social field, whether for senior citizens or health services, but also get involved in their own businesses. We are offering uh, up to $10,000 a year, no more, per individual in such projects to encourage them actually to create some of their own work. We have said Unlike uh, you, Mr. Turner, unlike the, the Liberal government, something ought to be done specifically for small business in terms of keeping lo low interest rates. Uh, in fact, keep interest rates low and separate, through changes in the Bank Act, uh, interest rate policy in general from a special one designed for small businesses and farmers. That would encourage specific job creation. Uh, so we have so far in this campaign made some specific suggestions that I think will work. Many of them, as I mentioned earlier, have been applied in Manitoba, and it's had an absolutely terrific record in the past year of producing jobs. Of course, one of the, uh, one of the reasons Manitoba has a, a lower unemployment rate these days is that it's ex exporting 2,000 uh, people a month out of the province of Manitoba into other parts of the country and into, into other parts of, uh, of this continent. What I'm saying well, is, in, in, uh, terms, in terms of specifics, I've been... Uh, specific on terms of what we need in terms of a national apprenticeship program and we will be announcing ours in Toronto in, in a week or so. In terms of small business, I've already laid out a program. We will be embellishing that and we'll be making it more precise as this election goes on. There's six weeks to go. But don't underestimate confidence, Mr. Mr. Broadbent. A good, deal, a good deal of what's happened to this country is that we've been tearing each other apart in terms of federal provincial relations, in terms of management, uh, labor disputes, and we really do need a reaching out and a new harmony. And uh, one well, of the things I plan to do uh, after September 4th is to reach out to the, to, the, to the labor movement, the organized labor movement, which may have a, a nominal allegiance uh, to your party, but knows as well as I do that if we are going to become competitive again in the world, we have to have more efficiency from management. We've got to have more efficiency from, from, from workers. We've got to have more cooperation in terms of the quality of work, safety at the workplace, and a goal that puts us back into the world marketplace. Uh, Mr. Turner, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You just said we've got to restore confidence. You can't write off your own government's record. It was uh, your party, after all, that's governed this country for the past 15 years, not mine. It was you, as Prime Minister, who said uh, a week ago that you supported everything that was done in the last few years. You can't have it both ways. You can't say I, uh, it was a terrible record. Uh, on, on the one, uh, you know, that we have to change all this that has been done, as you're now saying, and, and a few days ago you said what was done in the past three, year, three years you endorsed. I, uh, I'm coming into this after eight years away and in the private sector, Mr. Broadbent. I'm coming back because I think I have a contribution to make. I'm saying that the current uh, policy on the exchange rate on the dollar, yes, I support it. I don't think there's any alternative despite the pressures. But in terms of uh, what may have been done, 
I'm not defending that record. I'm talking about the future of what I can bring to it, what I can bring by way of a new team. We have a list of candidates across the country that are replacing some of the team that I inherited from Mr. Trudeau, and I think that we're going to be able to put a new face on Canada. So that, uh, fine, it's all very well for you to criticize what's went on in the past. I think what the Canadian people want to, to learn is what is going to happen tomorrow and out in the future. Oh, what we don't need is new faces. We need some new policies, in my view. Let's turn to our next question. Mr. Phillips, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. It's, uh, it's back to those wretched patronage uh, appointments, Mr. Turner, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, we here didn't think your answer last night uh, on the French debate got to the basic issue, which was the quality of your judgment in that particular case. You said you didn't want to make those appointments. You didn't think they were very good ones, but that Mr. Trudeau had held a gun to your head. Uh, some conversational experts now say the gun didn't have any bullets in it, but we'll put that aside. Why didn't you tell Mr. Turner, Mr. Trudeau, that if he wanted to go down in history as the man who sabotaged the party that had given its trust for 16 years, he was quite free to do that, but you were not going to stain your administration on the very first day of its life by agreeing to an unsavory bargain. We got the impression from all of this that uh, the very first time you were confronted with a choice between doing what you felt in your heart to be right and what was politically expedient, you chose expedience. I, uh, I'm going to say to you, as I've said uh, throughout the past uh, two weeks, that Mr. Trudeau had every right and privilege as Prime Minister of this country to make all of these appointments before he resigned. And he was prepared to do so. And he spoke to the caucus to that effect. Now, that would have placed me in a minority position, having a minority of seats in the House. And the advice I got, and I, there may be contrary advice that's available, but the advice I received, and I had, the, I had the, the job, and I had the evaluation to make, is that if that were to happen, the Governor General could have refused me the responsibility of forming a government. Now, that happens to be a fact. So I'm saying to you that I had no option. And I'm saying to the Canadian people, look at my record. When I was Minister of Consumer Affairs, the Canadian Consumer Council, I chose that council from among the best men and women in the country, regardless of political allegiance. When I was Minister of Justice, I used to even get some good comments from you, uh, Mr. Phillip, on the, on, the, uh, on the impartiality of those appointments. Yes, I appointed Liberals, but I also have appointed Conservatives and uh, New Democrats. And I appointed a good many men and women who had no political allegiance at all. And I'm saying to you, that my practice will be what my practice was. I will reach out for these appointments and instruct my ministers to find the best men and women available in this country, to find them regardless of political allegiance, to find them on the basis of quality and merit and competence, and find them so that they reflect the cultural mosaic of Canada and represent our visible minorities and our cultural, cultural groups in this country. That is the way I intend to conduct myself. And what we're, what we're talking about now is the end of an era. And uh, I'm, that, that is now washed clean as far as I'm concerned, and people will judge me on my record, I hope. Mr. Moderator, just may I one very brief point of clarification on, uh, on this very issue. Um, you still would have had the, the largest number of seats in the House, the normal basis on which a, a party leader is asked to form a government. Were you given any indication by the Governor General or anybody in Government House that you would not be called upon to form a government? That was the, that was the opinion and the understanding that, that I received. Right. And I'm telling you frankly, I'm telling the Canadian people frankly, that I had no option. And I'm saying this, I'm saying this to Canadians, and I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, telling uh, one story to, to members of my party and another, another story to the people of Canada. That is the situation the way I found it. And I tell you, sir, I had no option. Could I uh, just man, please. perhaps uh, ask Mr. Turner as Prime Minister now? It seems to me that uh, this practice of, of patronage is pretty deplorable. Uh, I think most fair-minded people think that. Um, there are a couple of specifics, perhaps, that you could commit yourself to that seem to me to make sense. Uh, the Law Society of Canada, for example, has recommended a procedure for getting patronage out of the appointment of judges to set up an impartial tribunal of some sort to take it out of the politician's hands entirely in the sense. I think that that, especially when it comes to the appointment of judges, would be a good one. I've endorsed that. I would like to know if you as Prime Minister would endorse that. And, and, the, and the second one I would like to get your reaction on. I have always found, as many Canadians <clears throat> have, are a Senate, uh, an abomination, frankly. Uh, everyone knows in the House of Commons that it does not act as a, a body of sober second thought. Some people are even dubious about uh, whether they're sober or not, but that's another question. 
the, the main point is that they're appointed, they're political hacks, I think, to put it bluntly. I mean, there's some good men. I don't want to overstate the case. There's some good men and women there. But the main point is they are appointed as patronage. The function has no useful role in a democracy. Would you support either abolition of the Senate, which I think would be a good idea, or at least making it elected? Well, let me respond, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the, to the first point. I looked at one time, when I was Minister of Justice, of setting up a panel of the Canadian Bar Society to, uh, to recommend, uh, to recommend uh, potential judicial appointments. The system I fell back on, and the system I preferred, was producing to the Committee of the Canadian Bar potential appointments from my office. In other words, I, re I got the candidacies from all over the country and then submitted them to the Canadian Bar. The Canadian Bar came back and said, qualified, very well qualified, or not qualified. And I think only once out of 130, 132 appointments did I fail to follow that recommendation. You know, leaving it to the Bar alone would be to introduce a new kind of politics. Don't think that organizations don't have their internal politics. No. You know, hospitals have politics, universities have politics, and the bar has politics. At least we were responsible as elected representatives to the Canadian people for our choices. The bar would not be. But you still I, appointed mostly liberals. No, 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 I appointed John Osler, who was a member of the Democratic Party. I appointed Tom Berger from Vancouver. I'm sorry he resigned from the bench. He was a, a very... Are very you saying judge. most of the people you appointed weren't liberals? I would say that... Uh, I would say perhaps most of them may have been liberals, but there, was a, there, were, there were a lot of conservatives, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of new, uh, new Democrats, and I would say that most of the people didn't ha have an active political allegiance. Mm -hmm. Now, on the Senate, I wrote a thesis at the University of British Columbia which uh, recommended the abolition of the Senate, as, as I think you know. You're in a position to act now. I came to the conclusion, I came to the conclusion that we couldn't do it within our federation because the provinces wouldn't allow that to happen. As for an elected Senate, I don't believe an elected Senate uh, would get by a constitutional revision with the provinces. I think uh, we were talked last night about not wanting to reopen a constitutional debate at this stage. I've looked at the Australian system where they do have an elected Senate, where one administration is responsible to a Senate and to a House of Representatives, here the House of Commons, and that brings its own kind of conflict. All I can say to you is, we have the Senate as it is, and I will undertake to raise the standard of those appointments. Your response, Mr. Broadbent, and then we'll go to the next no, question. Uh, I have nothing to say. I, I'm... Thank you. Mr. Truman, please. Mr. Turner, I don't want to cloud a serious social issue by, by harping on personal uh, idiosyncrasies. And I'm sure you don't want to do that either. <clears throat> but last night you continued to uh, defend your penchant for bottom patting, despite the fact that many women, uh, many people, women in particular perhaps, find it offensive. This, it seems to me, obviously affects your, your credibility on women's issues. Why don't you simply pledge to, to give up bottom padding right here and now, uh, or is it too deeply ingrained a habit to, uh, to make wild promises about it? I want you to know, Mr. Truman, that as I said last night, and I, I said uh, when, uh, when um, approached on the question, that uh, that gesture meant no disrespect at all. I happen to be a warm, outgoing person. People reach out to me. I reach out to them. And uh, the gesture was a mark of friendship. I think that my record and attitude, both in private life and running our law firm, and uh, in uh, all the associations I had before I came back into public life, and certainly during my campaign for the leadership, mm -hmm. has been one to, to, to indicate that I deeply believe in a crusade for economic equality of women in this country. My respect for women prompted me to, to uh, nominate the, uh, the first woman judge, Rajan Kola from Montreal, the first judge, woman judge appointed to a superior court in this country. My, uh, my campaign structure is led by women right across the country. The candidates who are, are, are running for the Liberal Party indicate their confidence in me. They know that I want women as equal partners running this country. And uh, now... Uh, uh, that is the way that uh, I would prefer it to be understood. Uh, my respect is fundamental and deep. Mr. Broadbent, please. Well, my comment uh, tonight is uh, the same as I said last night. I don't uh, find it particularly a, a desirable matter to get in, in, 
and discussion of this kind of personal activity, but I just find it, as I said last night in the other official language, uh, some kind of generation gap. I think that Mr. Turner has a, a kind of mentality in that kind of question that seems to think it appropriate to go around patting women on the derriere. And I, I just, I found it surprising and, and disturbing when I heard about it because in part perhaps I'm of a gen different generation, but I don't want to be self-righteous about it. I just happen to know that women today, most of them find that offensive. I happen to know that my daughter growing up uh, and, and her generation of young people would find it wrong. And I, I would like to think that a prime minister in the country wouldn't accept that kind of behavior. But I'd like to, I made my position clear on that kind of thing. I, I'd like to shift to the matter of, of policy on women that Mr. Turner just talked about. He, he said he's committed to the issue of uh, equality for women. I, I'd like to ask him what he thinks of his own government's record. He, he knows that since 1978 we've had legislation on the books providing uh, equal pay for work of equal value. He also knows, I hope, that uh, the Federal Department of Labor just this year condemned the federal government for not even implementing its own legislation that the wage gap between men and women in the public service alone uh, it last year grew. The gap spread by over $7,000. Instead, It is now over $7,000. Instead of being narrowed, it spread. The federal government's done nothing about it. And specifically, it hasn't set out standards via its own Department of Labor officials to enforce the application of the principle of equal work for equal value in the private sector so that the Department of Labor people can't even enforce that in the private sector. I am in favor of, of making both changes, of acting in the public sector quickly and also uh, sending out instructions with guidelines to Department of Labor officials to enforce it in the, in the private sector. May I, may I respond to Please. that because I think the question has been broadened now. Yeah. And uh, when I came back, uh, Mr. Broadbent, uh, to public life, uh, I found that uh, what you say is true. Uh, that despite legislation on the books, we haven't implemented in the federal public service equal pay for work of equal value. And I have ordered an acceleration of that process. Uh, we will wait, uh, of course, for the report of Judge Abella, but uh, I believe it should be extended into the crown, federal crown corporations of this country. And I believe it's also a, a subject for contract compliance with those uh, dealing with the federal government. Now, that's equal pay for work of equal value. When it comes to the the, uh, the future of, of women and their ability to, to, to achieve in this country, then I think the, the federal government also has a role to play. Uh, affirmative action. I am committed to affirmative action for equality of accessibility to jobs, equality of promotional opportunities, equality of career options, equality of training and counseling that will allow women to qualify for those jobs and to move up the managerial ladder. And those are fundamental to me. And I can tell you, uh, uh, since we started this uh, conversation on, on a personal note, my mother uh, was a widow with two children, my sister and me, in Ottawa during the Depression. And she was paid, when she became chief economist of the tariff board, two-thirds of what a man in a, single, a similar rank was, was, was being paid. Ever since those days, I don't need uh, the rhetoric. Uh, I understand what it means, and I am committed fundamentally to it, and there's not much distance between you and me on this particular subject. Well, could I get back to the specifics, though? In the private, we all know that most Canadians work in the private sector, not the public sector. And within federal jurisdiction, if I may say so, there's not an option for the government whether you would, uh, would want regulations in the public service or not, because that happens to be the law of Canada now. It should be enforced. But in the, in the private sector, it's not being enforced, even though we have legislation. And what I'm asking... Um, for you as Prime Minister, for a commitment to send out to Federal Department of Labor guidelines for enforcement of this principle of equal pay for work of equal value in those areas of federal jurisdiction authority. Right now, they have no such guidelines. Well, uh, I think we need some statutory framework for that. Uh, when it comes to the private sector, I think we recognize, first of all, that about nine-tenths of it is within provincial jurisdiction. Yes. And, but what uh, about the federal? All, all right, I think, but there's some conversations to be held with the provinces. Within the federal jurisdiction, I, I start from the basis of the federal public service, where we have statutory authority, into the federal crown corporations, into those who deal with the federal government. I think beyond that at this stage, we ought to set our own house in order, set some persuasive and moral guidelines, as you suggest, into the private sector, and hope that that will have, have an influence. I think that's where we have to begin. I think uh, we've got to do it one step at a time. 
We haven't got the federal public service. That house in order yet. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Mr. Halton, next question, please. Mr. Broadbent, I'd like to put a question to you. Uh, the polls at this stage of the campaign indicate a very strong possibility of a minority, minority conservative or minority liberal government. If that's the case and the NDP holds a balance of power, I'd like to hear from you your conditions for supporting that minority. And when you've spelled out those conditions, perhaps Mr. Turner could tell us whether he could live with those conditions. Well, let me begin by saying, uh, most seriously, that's entirely hypothetical. Uh, we are working now in the New Democratic Party, the same as Mr. Mulroney and Mr. Turner are working, to elect as many members of Parliament as we possibly can. That's our goal. Uh, we want to have in Parliament as many men and women elected from the NDP who will speak out for the concerns of ordinary Canadians. Now, after September 4th, who knows what will happen? But it seems to me appropriate for politicians uh, to, to address real questions, not hypothetical ones. and. The immediate task right now that we have in our party is to persuade people in this country, if you're really concerned about fair taxes, if you're really concerned about equality for women, if you want a, a top priority put on job creation, you vote for the New Democrats. Then we'll see what happens. Mr. Broadbent, uh, with respect, uh, you know you're going to end up in this election in third place. We know that. The public knows that. Could you answer my question and tell me what conditions you'd stipulate for propping up a minority government of either political stripe? No, I, I answer very frankly. Uh, it, it would be inappropriate for me to, to lay down some kinds of conditions. Uh, what the people of Canada could rely upon, and I mean that very deeply, is however we would use our influence in Parliament would be to further the issues that we campaigned on, because that would be morally the appropriate thing to do. And how that would be done would be publicly stated after September the 4th, when we are dealing with a real situation, rather than a number of hypothetical possibilities now. Mr. Phillips, your next question, please. <clears throat> Mr. Turner, a couple of years ago we had a program called Six and Five imposed on this country. The Canadian people were told that if they restrained their appetites uh, and fought inflation, interest rates would come down and unemployment would come down. Uh, the Canadian people have kept faith with this. We have restrained ourselves. The government has not. It's worth mentioning. Uh, but interest rates have not come down. They've gone up. Uh, and so has unemployment. You have told us no quick fix. Uh, we've been hearing that kind of rhetoric since this, uh, this campaign began. So there's something at work here, Mr. Turner. Is this situation so horrible that you cannot tell us, frankly, before this election what the medicine is needed to get this recovery going again, or that you don't have any ideas about what to do? Well, let's start with those interest rates, Mr. Phillip. Those interest rates in North America and around the world really reflect a fear on the part of investors and the money markets uh, of a return of inflation. And that fear is accentuated by the huge American deficit. The deficit in the United States, because of its overwhelming uh, influence on the world economy uh, and the crowding out for money between a very strong American economy and the need for the federal government down in the United States to borrow as well, is forcing the price of money up, forcing the interest rate up. And that is affecting us, the Canadian dollar, that is affecting the the British pound, the French franc, the German mark, and so on, and forcing interest rates up in all these countries. So that our current interest rate problem primarily is a reflection of an American and a worldwide situation. Now, we have our own debt problem. I described it last night. It's now costing us, as I said in my opening statement, 33 cents of every tax dollar to service. We could get our own house in better order and give ourselves more maneuverability from the overwhelming presence of the United States if we were to get that debt gradually into better shape. That would give us some maneuverability on interest rates and some maneuverability on our dollar. How to do that? I suggested last night. We can do it in three ways. We do it, uh, first of all, by looking uh, for growth, and I've described how we can get that growth back. We can look at it by cutting expenditures, or we can look at it by increasing taxes. Well, why don't you tell us what you're going to do? I, I'll tell you exactly what I'm going to do. I am going to look at that $90 billion budget, the federal government, 
There are programs that are duplications. There are programs that are wasteful. There's administration that's wasteful. There are programs that are no longer useful. There are programs that no longer serve a purpose. And I'm going to cut that down. I'm going to cut that down, and I've said it's not going to be at the expense of the disadvantaged or the unemployed or the, or the weak in this country, the, the, the aged and, and, and the ill. But there is room in a $90 billion budget to do it. And it will leave room for new programs that we're going to announce, and I will cost those new programs, and I was the first to say we were going to cost those programs. That is how we have to bring our affairs into order, and only then will we have some maneuverability and some freedom from the American interest rate phenomenon. But primarily, at the moment, the world is suffering through this situation. Mr. Broadbent? Well, where does one come in now exactly on this? I, I am concerned about the cutbacks. I, I am frankly... Um, willing to say there are certain certain federal expenditure programs that I think uh, should be curtailed, and, but I think a limited number at this time, uh, when we have uh, agencies within federal departments that do public relations, I think we could cut out uh, sending contracts out to the private sector and duplicating what people are hired to do in the, in the federal civil service and so on. But I, I also want to be candid with the people of Canada. I know that if you move significantly in cutting back in government programs, that what you do is you hurt the people of Canada. You have said uh, that you wouldn't do that. But Mr. Bennett said the same thing when he was uh, campaigning for re-election in British Columbia. And it's been a, a, just a virtual disaster in terms of senior citizens programs, education programs, uh, you name it, human rights programs. There's, because he said before the election, too, oh, well, you know, rely on me to cut the fat. There's fat there, but don't ask me to be specific. But then when he got power, he did a lot of things that are very harmful to ordinary people. And I think that as, as prime minister, if I were in this campaign, if I were going to take the position you have and said, yes, sir, God, God, we've got to trim fat, then I'd say what I was going to trim and then let people judge. And I think you should do the same thing, Mr. Turner. Well, you know, last night, Mr. Broadbent, uh, you came to the position, which surprised me, but pleased me, that you weren't going to add to the deficit or the national debt either. Excuse, and that, that excuse means, me. That, excuse me. I did not say that. Uh, I that's, that's the way I interpreted it. No, I did and, not say uh, that. I don't think it was your French or my French. But, could have been uh, my French. But I'll no, frankly say to you, it no, could but, have been my French. No, but I... Uh, I, uh, that's what I heard you say, in which case you're going to have to make choices like that. Yes, and I will be announcing them. That's, that's precisely the point I'm making. Any changes in program, whether it's expenditure, we will announce, and any cutbacks that, that I think are appropriate, I certainly won't talk in general terms. I will say what they are, because I think that that does a disservice to the whole political process if you aren't specific about what you're going to do. Well, we will be making the, the, same, sort of, uh, the same sort of precision as to what our programs will cost, because I think it is fundamental this stage in our, in our economic history and the problems we're facing, that we solve the problems of Canadians without burdening the next generation with what is an, an overwhelming mortgage on this country. Thank you, gentlemen. The first round is now over, and for the next 30 minutes, Mr. Broadbent will engage Mr. Mulrooney. Mr. Turner will not be involved, but will remain on the set. Mr. Truman, your question, please. Thank you. Mr. Mulrooney, uh, let's talk about unemployment about what you've had a lot to say in the course of uh, this campaign. A few weeks ago, you said as soon as there was a conservative government, uh, there would be tens and tens of thousands of new jobs. Is it really responsible to promise thousands of jobs like that overnight? As you've heard in the last few moments, we've been trying to get some specifics from uh, the gentleman uh, opposite. Can we now have instead a, a reasonably defined, a precise answer to the question we gave earlier? How much, uh, by how much will you reduce unemployment? How soon, by what means, and at what cost? Well, one thing that I won't do, uh, Mr. Truman, is blame the very serious economic situation in Canada uh, on the United States, as Mr. Turner has just done. He's just now bounced off uh, 20 years of tragedy here in this country on the United States. If we had similar figures here in, the United, in Canada, there would be hundreds of thousands on a prorated basis, people back to work here. Their unemployment rate is 7%. Their inflation rate is lower than ours. Their real growth is substantially higher, and their deficit on a prorated basis is less than ours. This idea of blaming uh, our neighbors for all of our problems, I think, uh, does a disservice to the country. We've put forward, uh, Mr. Truman, programs uh, that we've indicated very clearly are devised to do two things. A, to respect a fiscal framework, which allows us to pay down the deficit, and B, to create jobs. I laid out specific programs in the areas of forestry, which are so important to us, in the areas of um, uh, 
uh, Western transportation, agriculture, mining, where we address the fundamental sectors where we believe, uh, and the energy uh, sector, where we believe that by implementing these policies in a rational and thoughtful way over the life of our mandate, that in those areas 200,000 new jobs can be created. I said in my declaration at Prince Albert that there could be no miracles, that we would be left an overwhelming mess by the Liberals, and we didn't propose to blame it on anyone else. We propo proposed to lay it out carefully and thoughtfully for the Canadian people, together with specific programs, well costed out, within the limitations of an opposition party. We don't have hundreds of thousands of civil servants and a hundred billion dollars of taxpayers' money to use in this area. But I indicated that during the course of the campaign, in my first press conference in Ottawa, the day that the Prime Minister announced the election, that our programs would be laid out, they would be job creation intensive, they would be carefully costed as best we could, and they would reflect two things, Mr. Truman. On the one side, whatever cost was inherent, and on, other, the, on the other, the social benefit on the balance sheet. Let me explain. If you reduced your unemployment rate in this country by one percentage point, you would reduce your payout in UIC payments of in excess of $1 billion. You put 150,000 people back to work generating approximately $3 billion in new wealth, one third of which would automatically revert to the federal treasury. So you would have done two things. You would have reduced your deficit by, by paying it down by your outflow, and you would have enhanced the wealth side of your ledger. And that's the way you, you, we have to deal with it in reasonable terms, is by generating new wealth by dealing with the fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem is that this government has put 1.5 million people out of work, including over 500,000 young people. And they've said to them in their budgetary documents that they propose to leave them there for as long as it takes. Well, we're saying that the moral imperative of a new government is to put people back to work. And we're going to do it by a series of thoughtful, well-constructed and costed out programs that meet that job creation component and are going to put people back to work. Mr. Broadbent, you're off. Yes, I'd like to just come in and I think one of the useful things about these debates is that we can have serious discussion about priorities. Um, I listened to your suggested areas, Mr. Maroney, of uh, the forestry sector. Uh, we've had something to say about what should be done there, too. In the West, you did talk about upgrading the railway lines. That requires, again, public investment. The key area of concern I have, if you like, in terms of political credibility, a message here, is we are prepared to say, yes, we should have these public expenditures, but we are not saying as a party, simultaneously, that this year we will reduce the deficit. Now, I have seen a number of your speeches where you said your first priority would be to reduce the deficit, and Mr. McMillan, who is, I think, your chief of staff, is quoted publicly as saying that uh, a Mulroney government would bring down the deficit in the first year in office. Uh -huh. My question simply is this, is, is that your policy, to bring down the deficit in the first year? And if it, if it is, how are you going to have all these spending programs in the other areas? Well, I think I've got uh, a part of an answer for you, Mr. Broadbent. The answer... Uh, the statement is that, yes, we plan to reduce the deficit in an orderly manner. In the first during, year? During beginning, by sending out appropriate signals, but beginning during the life, the first term of the, of the new government. But I think your answer to, to your legitimate query about where the dollars come from, I think Mr. Turner answered it in, 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 in part last night. He said in his transcript, I believe that this reduction in massive expenditures could save us billions of dollars, billions of dollars. That Mr. Turner said was it uh, floating around the federal government and could be cut. We've been saying for years that there is a lot of waste and mismanagement in the government, and a large chunk of that, that money will come from bringing that degree of appropriate management to the government of Canada. And so we want to do two things. We want to do as best we can, recognizing that we've been left with this liberal legacy, this incredible liberal legacy of mismanagement, where they took a, a net debt that took a hundred years for this country to accumulate a net debt of eighteen billion dollars and they transformed that from eighteen billion to a hundred and eighty billion dollars from nineteen sixty eight that's an enormous burden to be placed on canada but notwithstanding that that painful legacy of mismanagement that's been left us by the liberals we are going to continue with investing in people we want change and part of that change is putting people back to work and that's going to require some gumption and some investment and we're ready to do it in people but within a sound fiscal framework that will see the orderly paying down of that deficit 
as new wealth is created in the country. Any further response, Mr. Broadbent? Well, we could go on a long time on this. Mr. Moroni, you say that uh, you want an orderly reduction of the deficit, that there is uh, lots of uh, fat in the government. Well, I come back to the question. I mean, all of us as politicians know we can say that. And it's very popular with many people in the can to say, oh, there's lots of fat in government, let's cut it out. Every, a lot of people say, hooray. But when they actually come around to seeing what's cut out, they frequently find out it's very important, like health services, hospitals, pensioners things, retraining programs. So I, I come back again, if you think you're going to move in reduction of the deficit this year, uh, you did say, after all, that Mr. Bennett in British Columbia was moving in the right direction when you were out there, and he's created not only social chaos, but he's created a massive turndown in the economy of, the, of British Columbia. Mr. Broadbent, yeah. may I just say this in yeah. regard to the, my statement about Mr. Bennett, which was a, over a year ago, which was, I, I thought that any movement towards restraint, and I didn't in any way endorse any specific one, but I thought that restraint was imperative in public spending, that it had to be brought under control. But, for example, the Liberals, in 1980, went out and campaigned on a slogan of elect us and we are going to reduce government spending. And it's gone from $60 billion to $100 billion a year in four years. They have violated their four cardinal promises. I assure you, I assure you that, that th there will be no cutbacks in those areas that impact upon the lives of ordinary working Canadians. That is for sure. But there's enough boondoggling by the Liberals uh, in this thing. And even the Prime Minister was good enough at least to acknowledge it last night. Billions, he said, in the plural. Well, he's going to have to tell us and tell Canadians how many billions. And because you and I, I think, could put some of those billions to profitable use. It might put a few liberals, might inconvenience a few, a few liberals, but it would be good for Canadians to be back to work. Mr. Halton, the next question, please. Mr. Broadbent, you're the only uh, party leader in this campaign who says that controls on foreign investment in Canada should be strengthened rather than weakened. I'd like to ask you what you say to a great many Canadians who feel that this country cannot afford the luxury of economic nationalism at a time when jobs are desperately short. Well, I, I say what seems to be the, be, be the economic obvious. First of all, we've been an e exporter of capital in the past few years, not a, a net importer. So we've had more going out than coming in. Uh, the second point that I make as a, as a leader of the New Democratic Party, we're not saying there shouldn't be any foreign investment. We are saying that the purpose of FIRA made a lot of sense, that when there is investment coming in, that in addition to making a profit for the investor, which is legitimate after all, if we say you, we want that investment to come in here, we ought to be saying as well there has to be an overall net benefit uh, for Canada. And the general principles of FIRA were that they had to make commitments to do so much research and development. They had, ought to make commitments to create a certain number of jobs and so on. So the purpose of screening is not to say there should be no foreign investment. It is to ensure that when it comes in, that there's a net benefit for Canada. Now, I think that is a very reasonable uh, proposition, Mr. Halton. In fact, I would suggest that if you look at the economic development of most of the industrial countries of Western Europe, as well as the United States, you would find that they have the equivalent of FIRA. They may not have that name, but they have a whole variety of mechanisms to ensure that when foreign investment comes in, it acts in their own benefit. And the country that's been most stringent about that, that happens to be doing very well in the world right now, happens to be Japan. Comment, well, Mr. Mulvaney? Yeah, on that point, uh, the, uh, a recent study indicated, for example, that there's been a net outflow of job-creating equity capital of almost $50 billion since approximately 1976, 1977 in this country. There's hundreds of thousands of jobs that have been driven out. We know that as a result of the liberal provisions, certain provisions of the NEP, because we agree with the, with the thrust, with the objectives, but certain provisions of the NEP drove out $17 billion in job-creating equity capital out of Western Canada. Mm. Devastated the economic soul of the West. The Liberals said not a word. They all remained silent, said this was, this was good for, for Canada. It killed Western Canada. And in the process, it did more than that. I was the other day to show you how important that we view this in a national light, that energy is a bond that, that should be bringing Canadians together. I was in Sault Ste. Marie, where there is a a facility there that cost in excess of $200 million that has never been, never not produced anything that was designed for the uh, Canadian energy market 
which is now paying in excess of $25 million a year in interest rates, where thousands of people, who are, there were to have been 800 direct jobs plus 2,000 indirect jobs in the Sioux, that has now gone by the boards because of the dimensions of the National Energy Program and other attitudes in Canada that said to foreign capital and to others, we don't want your money. We don't want you investing here. All I'm saying is that with two million people out of work across this country, there is not enough money in Canada to create the two million jobs that we need. And we are going to send a signal of confidence around the world to investors. There's a role for a fero like presence, an overview of our Canadian economy. But we are going to send a signal around the world to say, come and do business in Canada again with us, with us and our money and our, and our, our legislative arrangements because Canada is a good and an honorable place to do business again. We need that investment to create the two million jobs that this country so desperately needs. Any further response, Mr. Brubman? Well, I'd like to pursue that a bit because I, I agree with the general principle of fear. In fact, my party was the first to argue for its establishment many, many years ago, just after the founding of the New Democratic Party. Uh, we do make distinctions between certain sectors, though, uh, that I think ought to be made. The resource sector is one in particular where we think, and within that again, in the petroleum sector, where we should move very clearly in terms of Canadian ownership and control. Most countries in the world have uh, national control of their own petroleum resources. We stand out as a remarkable exception. And it was a former Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Mulroney, Mr. John Diefenbaker, back in 1957, who warned the people of Canada about the impact of multinationals owning our own oil industry. And he said that ultimately we would control, lose control of our own destiny if we didn't come to grips with that kind of resource sector. Now, my concern is that's where we say there should be further Canadianization, uh, an expansion of our own ownership and control so we're not dependent on multinationals. Your proposal in energy, as I understand it, uh, is to open the door once again to the multinationals to come back in uh, to buy up and regain more control in this particularly important energy sector. Very may, briefly, may, Mr. Mulroney. Just, just to disagree very briefly with Mr. Broadbent, I'm in agreement with the philosophy that you articulated on behalf of Mr. Diefenbaker. That's my philosophy. That's the philosophy of my party in, in, in this regard. I don't believe, however, that you serve Canada as a, as a national or in the energy industry or any other by sending out signals where you confiscate retroactively people's property. That back-in provision devastated confidence in Canada, not only in the energy sector, but in all other sectors around the world. And this is why we propose to build on our strengths. We, we agree with the kind of philosophy that Mr. Diefenbaker was articulating. I stick to it very strongly. But the methods of achieving it are not found in the NEP. They're found in the new attitudes, I believe, and the new methods of investment and attraction of capital, both nationally and internationally, that we refer to in our policies. We should move to the next issue, Mr. Mulroney. Mr. Phillips, your question, please. Well, I'd like to pursue employment. Uh, I think if I were an unemployed person with a couple of children paying a mortgage and my UIC benefits uh, running out very quickly, I would have listened to this debate so far, uh, not with any great uh, hope of improvement in the immediate future. And I think it gives added point to the question, Mr. Mulroney, that uh, Peter uh, put to you a few moments ago. Can you not give us some kind of unemployment reduction target? How soon? By what means and Mr. at what cost? Mr. Phillips, I can't do that. I wish I could. But we don't know until we get in there. We can't tell you how bad this situation truly is. For example, interest rates have gone up by two and a half points since February 15th, since the budget. That's thrown another three or four billion dollars onto the deficit, which has not been spoken about here. I mean, this impacts on interest rates. It then impacts on the value of the dollar. We, I cannot, I wish I could, give you a specific answer to that by, say, the 15th of September. I can tell you this. We have programs for youth employment that will change, alter dramatically the unemployment insurance fund to put young people back to work so they can be retrained during that period and not be unemployed. That we, will, we have talked about and will implement an investor series of investor tax credits for people with a small capital base and a weak capital base who will hire people immediately in that area. We are going as well with a national training program, a retraining program of which I've spoken uh, many times. We're going to encourage young people to get into the venture capital market. We're going to back them up. I mean, if this government 
can take a two and a half billion dollar write-off on Canadair, I'm ready to put money, $25,000, behind a group of young people in Esther Hazy, Saskatchewan, or Sault Ste. Marie, or Sydney, Nova Scotia, if they want to create three or five or seven jobs and remain at home. We are going to take a chance and back the young people of Canada in their own job creation schemes. We have our programs as well on the other levels that we, we believe will restore confidence, Mr. Phillips, will cause this renewal of in the very vital sectors to which I've referred of specific programs of energy, mining, forestry, agriculture, grain transportation, and so on. We have specific programs which we, we've articulated, but they're all within the kinds of frameworks that we've talked about, and we think they're good and productive. Well, but if, until if, we get in there, we're going to have a little difficulty in giving you the specific answer that you seek. If there's Mr. Specific, Broadbent, please. Yes, I, I would like to comment on this. Uh, the, I, I think a government can set targets, as a matter of fact. The uh, government of Canada set targets uh, a couple of year, few years ago for inflation. That was the 6 and 5 program. And it mobilized the people of Canada to achieve those targets. And I am totally convinced, for example, if we set a target to bring down unemployment, as the government of Manitoba did, they achieved a 2.5% reduction in one year. There's no reason, if the pre premiers had listened to Howard Pauley when he came to Ottawa, a couple of years ago at Christmas, he proposed a national program comparable to his own. If we had done that, we could have achieved at least a 2% reduction in unemployment. And I want to stress the, the side effects. By that kind, and let me say some of the things that are in it. First of all, there would be, from our point of view, we would not proceed with the tax increase that's scheduled to come in, into effect this fall that's going to take about a billion and a half out of the economy, which will have a net negative impact on jobs. We take action to keep interest rates down, and I think you can do that in Canada. We would, we would do the kind of job creation program that I announced earlier for young people that I'm pleased to see Mr. Moroni is supporting that would encourage them to create their own jobs. And we've had specific sector proposals. The point I want to make is that I accept your challenge and I wish the other political leaders would do this for the people of Canada, which is to set targets to bring down unemployment by a certain couple percentage points over a year, because then you have the political obligation of meeting those targets, and you can mobilize the resources in this country, young people and old people alike, to achieve that. We turn to Mr. Truman, please. I thought, uh, I thought Mr. Mulroney had, uh, had set a target. He said he would reduce unemployment by 1%, uh, and all we don't know about and it, was gonna, it wasn't going to cost us a cent, and uh, all we didn't know about it was how soon and at, uh, at what cost. Uh, no, I, I think, uh, Mr. Truman, that's... That was I, not a hypothetical case? No, I, 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 was, I was stating for you, we, we have no problem with targets at all. Uh, I, I'm trying to be fair with you and explain uh, that... Uh, uh, for example, the targets that were set in the United States, many of which have been achieved. A 7% uh, unemployment rate in Canada would, uh, would be pretty marvelous. And we're working towards that. That would be the kind of goal that we would be seeking. I, I've just tried to explain to you that there's a difference between a target and a firm commitment to achieve it until such time as we're in there with access to the kind of information. But no, I didn't make that, that statement. All we're doing is telling you that we have programs that will reduce unemployment, programs that will bring back investment and create jobs, and we believe that that way the wheel starts to turn and new wealth is created and there are new economic prospects for Canada. Mr. Broadbent? I, I have made the point that I want to make on this, that you can have targets. What's needed is a political will to achieve them. Thank you. Mr. Halton, please. Mr. Mulroney, could we switch to the tax reform issue for a moment? Uh, as you know, tens of thousands of Canadians uh, uh, including some millionaires, but mainly wealthy ones earning over $60,000 a year, aren't paying a cent of income tax, while a great deal of lower-income Canadians feel that they're taking it uh, in the neck. Would a Conservative government move to close loopholes in this area for the rich? Yes. Could you I tell us it, how? I think it's unfair that uh, uh, an individual uh, not pay a minimum tax. And uh, there are tax incentives to cause investment in given sectors and these provisions have been vetted and uh, approved by Parliament. Some of them will have to be changed and reviewed as we have proposed but in response to your direct question should anybody in this country of wealth and substance not pay tax the answer is no. Yes he should pay tax and it should be a handsome tax reflecting the kind of uh, advantage that he gets out of the country. Mr. Broadbent, I think it's unfair yeah. that, that, that there be no such 
tax uh, and that by the ongoing utilization of the tax system that you could use it ad vitam aeternam to preclude the possibility of your obligation of, meet, of paying taxes. Well, Mr. Mulroney, I've heard of conversions uh, at, the last, at the last minute, but we had uh, many debates in the House of Commons uh, on, on the economy and on, on taxation specifically, and it's the first time that I've heard that I've, your party supports the removal. I've, I've said it many times, Mr. Then, Mr. Then, I many take times. Your, then I take your word for it, if that's the case. Uh, I was not aware of it, and I am, I am pleased to hear that you will support the the removal of a, a tax system that permits very wealthy people to pay no tax at all. Mr. Phillips, please. Uh, just a couple of uh, quick foreign policy questions to you two gentlemen. Mr. Broadbent, you still have on your party books a resolution calling for the withdrawal of Canada from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Do you support that resolution? That's the, certainly do. That's the party policy. The cent we can, I can elaborate on that. The central question, of course, right now in the world is is nuclear disarmament. That's the number one uh, item on the agenda. We've made very specific proposals. Oh, that's uh, a different issue. Yes. yes. Uh, and I'd like to ask Mr. Mulroney, uh, Mr. Mulroney, you have uh, said on occasion that we must uh, give our American friends the benefit of the doubt on some of these issues, uh, but not at any price. One price I'd like to ask you about, does that mean support for the CIA's effort to overthrow the government of Nicaragua? Absolutely not. Okay. All I've said, Mr. Phillips, is that the, our traditional friendships with the British, the French, the Americans, with, with the Israelis, for example, has been badly eroded over the years by this government. And I've said that as a principal preoccupation of the conduct of foreign policy, if we have great friends, that we ought to be giving them the benefit of the doubt in, in moments like that, but it doesn't extend to that kind of circumstance, not at all. Any comment, Mr. Broadman? Well, the only comment I would make is that uh, the New Democratic Party has been very interested in what's going on in Central America and has opposed very strongly, persistently, consistently uh, the Reagan administration's involvement in other people's affairs uh, in a way that they should not be at all. Mr. Truman, question please. Yes, Mr. Broadbent, is it not a fact that in this uh, increasingly technological society of ours with a near stagnant uh, economy that the workforce is growing faster than the job market? And isn't it obvious, therefore, that uh, unless you've found some new way of extracting blood from a stone, that, that you and the trade unions should uh, be talking about not only about job sharing, but about pay sharing as well? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by pay sharing. If you mean by that a reduction in pay, then the answer is unequivocally no. I don't know. As a general proposition, I don't know another country in the world, that whether we take the leading ones in Western Europe or Japan, uh, or, or as a matter of national policy, uh, the United States even, that they're saying that you must have as a, as a commitment uh, to economic growth uh, an acceptance of poverty or movement in that direction. I think that there are alternatives. There, I am not arguing the, con the opposite of that. I'm not saying, for example, that the sky is the limit. Quite the opposite. I think that the bargaining approach, if I can put it this way. Uh, one of the outstanding unions in this country, as unbiased as I'm not, and outstanding leaders of the union is Bob White in the UAW in Canada. They took a very realistic position when uh, the automotive industry in this continent was in some competitive difficulty. They, in fact, accepted on, with one of the firms, the Chrysler Corporation, um, a freeze. They, they did uh, for a temporary period. They did not do that with the other companies. Uh, so they adjusted their wage and salary demands to the realism of the international economy, if you like. But we must not ever, it seems to me, say that we have to turn Canada into another Taiwan or some other third world country that is dependent on poverty level wages. Once we say that we should start going backwards in principle, that's the way we'll go. Could I have a, a supplementary? Are you saying, in effect, that the job sharing is not part of any viable answer to, to the unemployment problem? No, I'm not saying job sharing is not. I'm saying uh, income sharing, and that's why I specifically went back to you to see if you meant by that reduction income. Some, some sectors of the economy, job sharing, uh, where it's fully discussed with the employees affected, can make some, some sense. Any response, Mr. Mulroney? Mr. Halton, your question, please. Gentlemen, both of you are going to be debating before the, uh, the National Action Committee uh, on the Status of Women in Canada in a couple of weeks from now. That group, and it's a very influential one, as you know, 
has come out strongly in favor of abortion being a matter of private conscience and the removal of abortion from the criminal code in Canada. And I'd like to hear both your views on that issue. Mr. Mulroney first. I will... Um, I, I am of the view, personal view, that um, the provisions as presently uh, enacted in the statutes of Canada um, are sufficient uh, and uh, cover the matter. Not perfectly, I realize, uh, but uh, for the kind of pluralistic society in which we live, I believe they have met uh, the fundamental requirements. Mr. Broadbent? No, I don't agree with that. Uh, I, first of all, want to say that abortion should never be used as a, as a means of contraception. We should never encourage that practice in, in Canada. But I fundamentally and deeply believe in the freedom of choice option so that uh, women who don't, don't want an abortion, don't believe in it, are not obligated, obviously, to have one. But I also very strongly believe that those women who do believe in it ought to have the right to make that decision. It's not up to me to impose my uh, moral philosophy on that or anyone else to impose it on them. And therefore, uh, the provision in the criminal code should be removed about abortion. Mr. Phillips, next question, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Broadbent wouldn't deal with the subject of a minority government, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mulroney, even though there may very well be one, and he declines to tell the public what his policy would be in those circumstances, uh, and might well be unpleasant surprises in store, or pleasant surprises, too, I have to concede. Uh, if you were to uh, have the most seats in this election but fall short of a majority, uh, Mr. Mulroney, what would your position be? Would you try to take a page from Joe Clark's book and govern as though you had a majority, or would you seek alliances elsewhere? It is uh, our hope that we will secure a sound majority, a strong national government, which we're going to need to deal with the kinds of legacies of problems we will have been left with. And it won't be easy. We're going to require that kind of broad national strength. And I'm hoping we'll have that kind of, of result. Uh, if not, uh, Mr. Phillips, I'll have to look at it again with you. Uh, on election night, but we're satisfied that it's moving that way and the Canadians need that kind of change and will hopefully grant us that majority government. Uh, Mr. One Mr. quick Mr. supplementary Truman, question. Mr. Mr. Truman, there are less than two minutes left. Do you have a, a question okay. that will elicit I'll a go, brief answer? I'll go as quickly as I can. It's a tough question, but I'll try it on. Gentlemen, it's clear in the United States that in any contest between the economy and the environment, the economy is winning. In this country, we've got serious problems with uh, pollution. The national emblem, uh, the maple, is said to be threatened. At the same time, the economy is weakening. Now, the problem is jobs versus, uh, versus the environment. Are 100 jobs worth one lake? And if that isn't the choice, where do you draw the line and when? Mr. Broadbent, yeah. first and briefly, yeah. please. Uh, frankly, I don't think that's a trade-off at all. There have been estimates that came out of the government departments that showed that the longer we wait to deal with acid rain, the greater the net cost to the economy will be. So it's, it's either pay now and, and clean up our act or pay down the road. And I mean economic costs, uh, whether it's tourist trade, whether it's destruction of our forest and forest product industry, destruction of buildings. Uh, the, the impact of acid rain alone is horrendous in terms of economic costs. So I think we should move and move quickly on it. Uh, I think that uh, we have to toughen our, our pollution standards. Ontario Hydro, for example, is a major culprit. Action should be taken about that. I must Other aspects of the Moore environment, we don't even Mr. have Robert. a Clean Water Act in Canada, and we should act on that. They don't have Mr. negative Moore, job please. impacts. Well, I'll surprise you, Mr. Moderator. I agree with, uh, with much of what uh, Mr. Broadbent has said. He's, he's quite right uh, that, uh, for example, in the area of, um, of this dimension of pollution. But I think one other thing that would be required, and, and, and I would agree with the kinds of things he's been saying, that the balance sheets of those companies, the four or five major companies who are involved, have been so weakened by the, by the recession that in cooperation with the unions, that there's going to have to be some consideration given by the federal government to get them over the hurdle of cooperating in this massive effort to clean up our lakes and air in Canada. Thank you, gentlemen. The second round is over. Mr. Mulrooney, you will now engage Mr. Turner for the next 30 minutes. Mr. Broadbent will not participate, but of course will remain on the set. The question goes to Mr. Halton. Do I have it? Mr. Johnson, you mentioned uh, Ed Broadbent, the man in the middle here tonight. He's been calling both of you gentlemen the Bobsy twins of this election <coughs> campaign. And and frankly, on a long list of economic issues, from energy to the role of the private sector, your views often do seem remarkably indistinguishable. Can we 
challenge both of you tonight to define some real differences between you on these key economic issues. Well, if they're Bobsy twins, Mr. Halton, here are the two twins. In 1972, Mr. Broadbent's party was propping up the Liberals, and they propped them up all during that minority period. In 1979, they got together again to drive the Conservative government out of office after nine months, and they've, they've propped each other up in a number of times. So I, I don't want to deprive Mr. Broadbent of a good line. But if they're Bobsy twins, they're over here and I'm not in it. Look, at, we bring to this debate the dimension of newness. We have not been in there for 20 years, for this long 20 years. We bring new people with new ideas, new approaches to governing Canada. We have not been part of that co-mingling that's gone on between the Liberal Party and the upper reaches of the civil service. We have been in the regions, in the small towns. We have been in the private sector, and we have been fighting for a different kind of Canada. A Canada based on the, on the private sector, a Canada that calls us to, to live within our means, to be frugal with the taxpayers' money, to energize the small and medium business sector. These are the kinds of programs that we have been speaking about for years. We said no to certain provisions of the National Energy Program. We, we talked about the forestry sector, about the importance of agriculture, about the entrepreneurial spirit which was almost extinguished, which has been killed in this country by taxation and by the crippling burden of paperwork. We have set out time and time again our structures and views for renewal of Canada and the new hope that we have to bring, the new attitudes and the new people. And that's what separates us from people who have been there for 20 or 25 years who have been largely responsible for the enormous problems that have been inflicted upon Canada. And so what you have, people who have attitudes who not only refuse to change, but say that change is, un, is not necessary. Change is vital in our society. And the differences, I think, that people have to choose from are the old way of doing things and new hope for the future. Mr. Turner, please. Well, I think, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, the first difference is between Mr. Mulroney and myself is that I have been out for eight years, I've come back, and I have the widest mix of public and private experience of anybody on this podium. And I bring to the Canadian people a unique combination of knowing what it's like out there, and yet having spent 14 years in Parliament and 10 years in the Government of Canada, and then the last eight years in the private sector of our country. Another difference between me and Mr. Mulroney, I have consistently said since my return to private life, to public life rather, that I want to work on the public debt of this country without uh, hurting the, the poor and without hurting the disadvantaged. That I consider the public debt a mortgage on this country that our young people are going to have some difficulty with. Mr. Mulroney, on the evidence of his friend Mr. Crosby, who was Minister of Finance under the Clark government, has got a series of programs that he's dropping recklessly across the country that make him the $20 billion man. But Mr. And, Turner, and, and, uh, wait, wait Mr. Now. Turner, why would you say that when you know that it's inaccurate? Well, I, 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 cite, I cite a recent interview of Mr. Crosby on yeah. Canada AM. When he was quite inaccurate. When he was asked whether that was a, a, a reasonable figure, yes, he said it was conceivable. I indicated when, he was asked about the, when he was asked about the Prince Albert Charter, he said, yes, that was between 5 and $6 billion of that amount. I'm just saying to you that uh, the promises you have been making to the country, and now only recently starting to cost them, were a direct departure from the way you ran your leadership campaign where you said you were going to try to reduce the deficit by 1987 and now of course when you're where you're caught with the the issue of a of, of a public debt that is becoming a concern to the the country and to the young people in this country you you're, you're trying to cut back your sales again but that's not that's not what you did mr turner i'm quite astonished you heard me last night you heard me say quite clearly that 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 was not the case You've heard Mr. Crosby say that that's not the case. I think we're both honorable men. Why would you persist in repeating something that we have both formally denied and you happen to know is an, an inaccuracy? I, may, may I say this? May I say this further? You talk about the public debt. You're the father of, of, of the public debt in this country. You inherited, as Minister of Finance, and I say this with no malice, it's an historical fact, you inherited a $600 million surplus as Minister of Finance, and you transformed it into a $4 billion deficit before you returned to the, to the private sector. So I, I suggest, sir, that you ought to be somewhat prudent in regard to what other people are saying, because I can assure you, I give, I give you the further assurance if you require it, 
that neither Mr. Crosby nor I ever said anything like that. You're aware of that. And in terms of profligacy, it is widely known that in your short period of Minister of Finance, inflation doubled, interest rates almost doubled, the federal debt doubled, and the $600 million was transformed into an operating debt of $4 now, billion, dollars, like or, or, or thereabouts. I'd like to reply to Mr. So I, I think that it's important those, that you remember that. Those facts are not correct. I think they are, sir. During the four years of my mandate, and we again went through this last night, the four years over which I had custody for the country's finances, I had the last two surpluses in the history of this country. And the average of 1974-75 was a difficult year. It was a recession year. And as I said in my budget, we leaned on the, on the side of unemployment. And that deficit went up to $3.5 billion. But you take the four years over which I had the responsibility for, for, for the finances of Canada, the average deficit was under three quarters of a billion dollars. Well, Mr. Turner, this, now, is, this is silly. If you were to average out the temperature in this country, it would be 85 degrees in February in Bay Como. You now, can't run the country I, this way. I, I'm they, just saying... These I, were deficits I, for which you're responsible. I am just saying... And all I'm saying, sir, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll conclude on this, all I'm saying is that in light of this, of your own track record, sir, it would seem to me that prudence would be required in your attacking Mr. Crosby or Mr. Me or, or myself because we've just tried to indicate, and all our, our actions have been consistent, that what we put forward, A, will be costed out, as I indicated, and will be re revealed to you, as I indicated in my first press conference, and B, it will be within a sound fiscal framework that will put people back to work. Well, I, I look forward to that, uh, Mr. Motorway. You Mr. asked me, Mr. Halton, for another difference. I've been saying the same thing to my party on all the issues that I say to the country. We had this patronage issue brought up earlier. Mr. Mulroney has not been dealing with that issue in the same way. He told his party last year that he was going to ensure that every available job was going to be available, made available to every living, breathing conservative. And, uh, you know, I, I can, I, I've, got, I've got these facts right, right here. I can give you this quote, which comes from the Montreal Gazette, May 18, 1983. Oh, there'll be jobs for liberals and NDPers too, but only after I've been Prime Minister for 15 years and I can't find a single living, breathing Tory to appoint. Now, when accosted with that statement, when accosted with that statement, Mr. Mulroney said, well, you know, you have to treat the party faithful one way, but now we have an election and I'm ta talking differently to Canadians. I, well, beg, I am just saying to you. I beg your pardon, sir. And you said that, I, that you said you were just no, joking last I, I, night. No, I, that sure. is not a joking matter. No, I beg. No, no, it isn't a joking it matter. Is. But you, sir, have raised this patronage to new to new heights. You have done something that's never been done before. Appointed 19 in one of the most, I think, generally recognized, in that really quite remarkable act of appointing 19 liberal members of parliament on the last second in a secret deal, with a letter that you have yet to produce to the Canadian people. I made those statements in the full light of day during a leadership campaign. I made them as someone who has never made a political appointment in my life. I'm a member of a political party. I've never benefited from one. The Liberals have made all of the thousands of appointments over the last two decades or so here in Ottawa. Sure that from time to time I'll acknowledge and I apologized for it. I apologized for it, which is perhaps what you should have done, sir, for having made them in the first place. But I acknowledge that I said that with a smile, and it was captured by the television cameras during the course of a debate. But the point, of, the fact of the matter, sir, is that you took a secret arrangement and you honored it on behalf of a political party, I think to the detriment of Canada. Well, I'm just saying to you, Mr. Mulroney, that I say the same thing to my party publicly and so do as I, I say to Canadians And publicly. so do I. We should move to the next issue. Mr. Phillips, please. Yes, I'd like to see if we can't get some clearer idea of what... Uh, Mr. Turner's uh, fiscal policies are. Mr. Turner, you've said you'd get the country going, but you wouldn't hurt anybody. Are you going to raise taxes if you uh, win the election? I said last night, uh, Mr. Phillips, I repeat now, that I'm hoping that uh, with the new programs that we introduce on youth and for small business, that those programs can be financed out of a re reallocation of the, of the current uh, budgetary, uh, budgetary framework. Uh, raising taxes, no, I do not anticipate raising taxes, well, I, except for those that are already scheduled to be raised. I have, I have any, this difficulty. Any comment, Mr. Mulroney? Well, you can't have it both ways. Uh, Mr. Turner says he's not going to raise any taxes, and there are tax uh, increases for the 1st of October. Uh, it's a question of credit. I said that those were already scheduled. Yes, those are already yeah. scheduled, but they're massive. 
And uh, so I, I, I genuinely don't think that you can have it both ways, but I'll, I know that Mr. Phillips wants another question. And Mr. Truman, it's your turn, please. You've both been at some pains, uh, gentlemen, in the, in the course of this campaign and the leadership contest which preceded it to establish uh, your own modest origins. But there's a, a public perception, I think, that if you were not born with silver spoons in your mouths, you, you have acquired them since, that you now represent uh, the interests of a wealthy and privileged corporate class. Perhaps you could begin, Mr. Mulroney. How do you propose to convince anyone with a wife, a children, and no house that you are really interested in seeing that he gets a down payment for such a house in his pocket? I suppose, uh, Mr. Truman, by doing the only thing, by speaking honestly and in a straightforward manner about problems with which I'm familiar. I come from a working class family where my father was an electrician who held down two jobs to look after a family. We all worked all our lives to get ahead. I think I'm aware of, of what it's about. Canada is about working hard and making sacrifices and hopefully having some success. And that doesn't preclude me in any way from understanding in a genuine and, and heartfelt way the, the problems of ordinary Canadians. That's exactly where, where, where I am. And so all I can tell you, sir, is that those problems are my problems. I, I lived with them. I, I grew up with them. I understand them as intimately, I guess, as I understand anything. And I'm deeply committed to not only resolving them, it's the only reason I'm here, is to try and be helpful to the ordinary Canadian who deserves a better break out of this magnificent country, who hasn't had it because our governments have not provided the kinds of frameworks within which prosperity could be shared by him and by his family the kinds of opportunities that I had uh, when I was growing up on the North Shore. We didn't have much, but we, we were told then that you had an opportunity. I started driving a truck, but that was a great opportunity for me. And I was honored to have it. Great to have that job. And I worked in a paper mill as a laborer. And then I got promoted to an electrician's helper, and that was tremendous. But we had that opportunity. And today, Kids that age don't even have that opportunity anymore. We have 500,000 young people who would love to have a job driving a truck as I did. And we can't give them that anymore. And I want to make sure that those younger people and others have that opportunity that we always associated with Canada. It's what Canada's all about. It's hope and it's opportunity and it's sacrifice and it's hard work. And it's knowing that if you do that, you're going to get a break and you're going to get ahead. That's what Canada's all about. And that's what we want Mr. to restore Turner, to this country. Please. Well, Mr. Truman, I, uh, I find it, uh, I'm always uneasy talking about this sort of thing, but, um, and I don't uh, think I want to get necessarily into a contest of humility with uh, Mr. Mulroney. But uh, my mother was a widow, came to this town in the winter of 1933-34 with two children, with no background at all, no connections, found a job in the public service of this country, and worked her way through it. And we lived uh, in modest circumstances in Ottawa as we grew up, and I've got a lot of friends from public school here and high school here in this town who've known me from those days that we came from a modest up upbringing. Her, uh, her father was a miner in Rossland, British Columbia. And I had, the, I had the good fortune of going back to Rossland during the leadership campaign and seeing the old family house where I spent some time there. So, yes, uh, I share a humble, humble, humble uh, upbringing, uh, but I've worked hard, as Ms. Mulroney has. I've had some luck in life. I've been successful, I've been recycled a number of times in and out of uh, public and private life, and the reason I came back is because I thought that I had some, something to bring to this country to answer the problem you're talking about. Ordinary men and women with children who wonder what's happened. This recession brutalized us. 1981, 82, and 83 were the worst years since the Depression. There are men and women out of work through no fault of their own. They've been laid off by the cycle or by technology or by change. And they're facing the problem of their own dignity and wondering whether they can maintain their hopes. Now, I, I believe that uh, uh, one, one reason that uh, I joined a political party years ago on the Liberal Party, that this country, which has been nourished by every land in the world, we've had immigrants from all over. As a matter of fact, I'm the first foreign, foreign prime minister this century, I think, that no matter where you come from, or how long you've lived here, or what the color of your skin is, or the language you speak, or the faith you practice, 
that if you work hard enough, and if you have enough self-discipline, and if you have enough perseverance and a little luck, you can go all the way in Canada. We should move to the next issue, Mr. Turner. Mr. Halton, please, your question. Gentlemen, I'd like to ask both of you, if I could, whether you're only in this race, in a sense, for the big prize, becoming prime minister, running the government, or whether you can give us a commitment here and now that if each of your party loses, that you can give us a commitment that you'll hang in there for four years as opposition leader. Well, uh, shall I start, Mr. Mulroney? Uh, I, uh, I gave a commitment, Mr. Halton, to myself and to my party when I threw my hat into the ring on March 16th for the leadership of the Liberal Party. Uh, that uh, win or lose, I would uh, rebuild the party into a national party from coast to coast. I would rebuild the West. I would make our party again acceptable to Western Canadians, and I would recruit Western Canadians to stand and run for the Liberal Party. Now, uh, I expect to win a majority. But when I entered... Uh, when I entered the race on March 16th, we were 25 points behind in the polls. That, I think, demonstrates my commitment to public life, to the party to which I belong and have the honor of leading. I expect to win this election with a majority of members in the House of Commons. But my commitment goes beyond that. Mr. Mulroney, please. Mr. Halton, I, I'm a child of the Conservative Party. I joined the party in Nova Scotia when Bob Stanfield was leader of the opposition. And... Uh, and Mr. Diefenbaker became leader of the opposition here, and I've spent my life in the party, most of it in opposition. We haven't had the privileges of, of the Liberals, and this is the reason why I'm here and why I, I hope to do well with my colleagues in the election. There has been a monopoly on power, and power corrodes. I won't go any further than that. It distorts. It distorts people. It affects people. When they're around too long, things happen on the federal level. And that's why alternation, change, is so vital in a democracy. It's so indispensable to the functioning of our political parties and to Canada. And that's why, as a progressive conservative, we've been reaching out in, I think, a remarkable way, I hope so, to minorities and to French Canadians and to others across the country, from West to Newfoundland, to rebuild a brand new majority, such as the one that Mr. Diefenbaker put together, so that we can offer Canadians honorable democratic change. When one party exercises the, that kind of political hegemony for an undue period of time, the soul of the country suffers. And I will be here, sir, I hope to be honored, with a majority government, uh, but irrespective of that, I will be here to serve my party as long as they want me. Mr. Phillips, please. In the event no party gets a clear majority in this election, Mr. Turner, and your party comes in with fewer seats than the Conservative God, Party. You have, you have tried so hard, Mr. Phillips, yes, for, I for, have. For, for, for an answer to that question tonight. Uh, will, will, but, you, will you respect the clear indication of change expressed by such a vote and ask the Governor-General to call on Mr. Mulroney? You know, or, will you, or will you try to deal with Mr. Broadbent to I, construct a coalition? Uh, I, I hope that I can earn the confidence of the Canadian people in the next six weeks so they, they feel uh, that I and the party I lead with the new people we're bringing in from all over Canada is best equipped to handle a very difficult economic situation. That the, that the blend of experience and freshness and newness that I bring to the scene will give our party a majority. No, now, uh, uh, one deals with Parliament as the people of Canada give us Parliament. And really, the people of Canada will determine the complexion of how the three of us do. Uh, I've, got to know, uh, I've got to know them a little better tonight. Well, for, 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 Mr. <laughs> for Mr. Turner to talk about... Uh, about newness and change is, re is really quite, uh, it's, if I may say so, borders on the, on the frivolous. The fact of the matter is it's the same old bunch, the same old group of people with the same old attitudes. The, Mr. Turner has endorsed what has gone on, the sadness in so many homes tonight, the high interest rates, the crippling unemployment. He's, in, he's given Mr. Lalonde and his colleagues a blank check on that one. As far as the attitudes, I think the appointments to which, which we discussed earlier, I think confirm the fact that it's the old boy network back in town, that the boys are, the boys are back, 
and that they don't, the Liberal Party doesn't want change. This country desperately wants genuine, profound, attitudinal change. And that requires, from time to time, new people with new attitudes and new hopes for Canada. And that's what's wrong, I think, with a government that's tired and that's fatigued and that's been there too long. I would say, uh, Mr. Mulroney, that uh, on the basis of what you've talked about getting your nose in the public trough, that you wouldn't offer Canadians any newness in the style of, uh, of government. I, the style that you've been preaching to your own party reminds me of the old Union Nationale. It reminds me of uh, patronage at its best. And uh, frankly, on the basis of your performance, I can't see freshness coming out of your Mr. choice. Mr. Turner, the only person who has ever appointed around here for the last 20 odd years has been your party. And 99% of them have been liberals. Uh, to, and, and you ought not to be proud of that. Nor should you repeat something that I think you know to be inaccurate. You know full well that that was a figure of speech that was used, and I, and I, I don't deny it. In fact, I've gone so far because I believe what you did was so bad. I've gone so, par I've gone so far, sir, to apologize for, for, for even kidding about it. I've apologized to the Canadian people for kidding about it. The least you should do is to apologize for having made these horrible appointments. I've had the decency, I think, to acknowledge that I was wrong in, in, in even kidding about it. I shouldn't have done that, and I've said so. You, sir, at least owe the Canadian people a profound apology for doing it. The cost of that, $84.4 million, is enough to give the, the cost of that to the ordinary Canadian taxpayer. We could pay every senior citizen in this country on the supplement an extra $70 at Christmas rather than pay for those liberal appointments. And I say to you, sir, two things. A, you should produce that letter because you keep coming back to, to this situation. Please produce the, letter, the secret letter that you signed, that you undertook to make these appointments. And B, may I say respectfully that I think that if, if I felt I owed it to the Canadian people, and I did, an apology for bantering about the subject, you, sir, owe the Canadian people a deep apology for having indulged in that kind of practice with those kinds of appointments. Well, I've told you and told the Canadian people, Mr. Mulroney, that I had no option. Mr. Well, Truman, your next you, question, you had an option, sir. You could have said, I am not going to do it. This is wrong for Canada, and I am not going to ask Canadians to pay the price. You had an option, sir, to say no, and you chose to say yes I... to the old attitudes and the old stories of the Liberal Party. That, sir, if I may say respectfully, that is not good enough for Canadians. I had no option if I was able that to... That is an avowal of failure. That is a confession I, of non-leadership. And this country needs leadership. You had an option, sir. Mr. You Turner, could have done better. Mr. Turner, your response, please. I, I, I just said, uh, Mr. Moderator, taking the Canadian people through the circumstances, Mr. Trudeau had every right to make those appointments before he resigned. In order that he not do so, yes, I had to make a commitment to him. Otherwise, I was advised that with serious consequences to the Canadian people, I could not have been granted the opportunity of forming a government. Mr. Truman, next question, please. Since you gentlemen seem determined to stay on this patronage uh, question, perhaps I could give you a, a cooler uh, kind of entry into it by reminding Mr. Mulroney that he said last night he would favor a parliamentary committee to, to pass judgment on patronage appointments. I think Mr. Turner made the uh, comment at that time he doubted whether anyone having to face this kind of U.S. Congressional Inquisition would want to offer himself for that kind of public office. But, Mr. Mulroney, what appointments are, are you talking about? There are thousands of them. Uh, would they all be subject to no, parliamentary sir. scrutiny? No, sir. In my book a year and a half ago, or thereabouts, I, I thought that, and I recommended, that all people who were destined to hold senior economic creating portfolios, Deputy Minister of Finance, Deputy Minister of Trade, External, and so on, should go before a committee of the House of Commons for ratification, so that we would understand the thinking, the philosophy that goes into budget preparation, into those things that impact so heavily on our lives. With regard to, and I'll acknowledge, uh, Mr., uh, I'll acknowledge, sir, that, that I was so badly, I was startled by what the Mr. Turner did, as, as was the country, badly taken aback. And I, I had to rethink my own position, and I thought that it might be helpful if those appointees who exercise quasi-judicial functions, for example, a senior member of the CRTC, the chairman of the CTC, should go before the Transport Committee or the Communications Committee of the House so that we could understand better who he or she is, where he's coming from, what's his background, what kind of contribution. Is he qualified? Is he or she qualified in this 
complex area of our life? Or is he or she only there because they happen to be stalwart liberals? I don't think they should be excluded only because they're stalwart liberals. Don't misunderstand me. But there ought to be other criteria, and I thought, sir, this was a good way of vetting them. Mr. Turner, any comment? Well, uh, I've, uh, you know, I examined the, the process for a long time uh, when I had the responsibility of uh, appointing judges. And I allowed, the, I allowed the professional body, which had the best measure of their ability, to do the screening. Uh, I knew, and uh, after talking to the bar, knew that if there were a more public process, a good many of the better candidates that we seek would not be willing to put their names forward and then have them rejected after a public, public scrutiny. Uh, that's the American practice because they have a separation of powers. I would prefer that the, the process in this country be consultation from the, say, the transportation industry, if you're talking about the CRTC, rather than having it uh, as, as, a, as, as a type of American uh, congressional uh, review. Mr. Halton, your next question, please. Gentlemen, we haven't devoted much time tonight to the overwhelmingly important issue of, of peace in a nuclear age. I'd like to ask you about the fact that the Trudeau government, despite uh, its peace initiative, uh, refused to support a mutual and verifiable nuclear freeze. Operation Dismantle claims in its polls that 80% of Canadians support such a freeze. Why won't either of you come out here and now and say that you too can support a nuclear freeze? Mr. Turner. Well, I, uh, I, I follow the position of Mr. Trudeau for the, the reasons uh, uh, to which he subscribed. I, uh, I think the, the better, the, the better uh, the process is to move with our allies in NATO, Europe and the United States, to move towards a general uh, disarmament uh, uh, program, particularly in the nuclear field, and that uh, uh, that is a, a better fashion in preserving uh, a negotiating position and preserving the credibility of the, of the, uh, of the deterrent. Mr. Moroni, please. I think the conduct of the, of the Liberal government, if I may say so, uh, over the last 15 years, the attempt to withdraw from NATO, the constant downgrading of our NATO commitments, of our NORAD commitments, the downgrading of our relationships with our allies, the constant harassment of our allies, the fact that our contribution to conventional defense is now where is so now so little that we spend less than any other civilized country with the exception of Luxembourg. All of this has placed us in a position so invidious vis-a-vis -vis our allies that we have no opportunity to but to establish our bona fides but to maintain this kind of commitment to to NATO which precludes the kind of uh, suggestion to which you um, allude. It may very well be uh, Mr. Halton because the question of peace has to be the most important subject on any agenda. It's one to which I and my party give the highest degree of commitment. There, there's nothing more, more compelling than the search for peace that we leave for as best we can in a country this size and with our degree of influence, a world free of nuclear arms. That's our commitment. But we have our conventional uh, roles and obligations to respect. And because of our pretty bad record, we are going to have to make sure that we respect them so that we get hearings in other vital areas. We have very briefly, Mr. Turner. I'd, I'd just like to respond in saying that I think Mr. Mulroney knows of my commitment and the commitment of my party to NATO. We are living up to our 3% uh, uh, increase per year in, in defense expenditures. We are living up to those commitments, and we shall continue to live up to them. We have I, I believe that using NATO is the best avenue we have to have leverage and influence to work towards world peace and world nuclear disarmament. We have less than two minutes left to question yes. Mr. Phillips elucidating a very yes. brief response. Yes, well, I will be brief, uh, Mr. Moderator. We haven't uh, apparently been very successful tonight in identifying what it is that will happen after September the 4th. Perhaps you could be more successful in identifying what will not happen after September 4th. There's a lot of talk around that you gentlemen have hidden agendas that uh, harsh economic measures and harsh medicine are necessary that you're afraid to talk about it in this campaign and will only wait until you get a mandate to bring it in. Mr. Turner. Is that a found, well-founded suspicion? 30 mm. seconds only, please. No, sir, it isn't. I've set forth uh, the problem of, uh, that the country faces, the problem of the public debt. I've said uh, where we can finance our programs. I've said that uh, the facts are out for the Canadian people. Well, the programs will speak for themselves. 
There'll have to be some reallocation of funding to meet the new priorities for youth, preserving our safety net for those who can't take care of themselves in this country. Mr. Maroney, 30 seconds only. The please. attitude of openness to which Mr. Turner replies, here you have the Auditor General of Canada who has to sue the government of Canada to try and get information relating to, to Petrofina shares. What we are going to do is bring the House back quickly, open the books, tell the people the truth, get the Auditor General in everywhere. We're going to tell the people the facts. We're going to share with them how bad it is because the government is hiding as some of the, 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 the true dimensions of our problem. We're going to share it with Canadians. We're going to set out a true and an honest accounting. We're going to set out specific programs to get the country moving again. And together, we're going to build a new kind of prosperity beginning uh, in the early autumn of this year. Thank you, gentlemen. I regret so much our time has expired. We've now completed the three rounds of the debate. Each leader will have up to four minutes for his closing remarks. The order of speaking, of course, is the reverse of the opening statements. Mr. Mulroney will go first, then Mr. Turner, and finally Mr. Broadbent. Mr. Mulroney, please. I think that the questions that our votes, all of our votes, will have to answer on September 4 relate to the truth that we all face together the morning after and in all the mornings thereafter, the 5th, the 6th, and the 7th. And some of these questions, I think, come out at us tonight. Do you really believe that if the Liberal government is returned, there is going to be any real change in the attitudes of those who have been stalking power here in Ottawa for 20 or 25 years? If you're unemployed, or if you're concerned about keeping your job, do you have any confidence in your prospects as a result of the attitudes that you have heard or seen over the last four years? Remember that the Liberals made four promises, four solemn undertakings to Canadians in 1980. They came before you and they said four things and then put them in the throne speech. First, 18 cents a gallon is too much. And it went up to over $1.50. Secondly, we're going to reduce unemployment. When they made that promise, there were 800,000 Canadians unemployed, there are now a million five. Then they said we're going to reduce the growth in government expenditures. It's gone up from 60 billion to 100 billion. And then they said we give you a formal undertaking that we are going to reduce the deficit in an orderly manner. The deficit's gone from 10 billion to 36 billion dollars a year. It took Canada 100 years from 1867 to 1967 to accumulate a net debt of 18 billion dollars and from 1968 with Mr. Turner there and his colleagues from 1968 to today 15 years our net debt has gone from 18 billion to 180 billion dollars that's not the fault of the Americans as Mr. Turner suggests that's not the fault of our friends and allies that's the fault of the people who have been running this country who have been initiating deficit financing, who have been spending more than they could take in, who have been crippling the private sector. And so what we're saying is that we have candidates, men and women of value across Canada who have listened to, her, to you, who are from your regions, who understand the requirements of new growth, and new possibilities, the retraining that has to go on, the equality of economic opportunity, a new program of productivity enhancement, we must recapture our share of world trade. Those are where the jobs are. We've got to build this new cooperative society together with the provinces, with organized labor, with management. We have hundreds of thousands of jobs that can be built based on cooperation. Mr. Turner says that there's no cooperation. He's right. He was a member of the government that said that cooperative federalism was dead. We say it's alive. We say there's a new spirit possible in this country. There's a new day coming for Canada, and that day brings new hope, and new prosperity. The Conservatives, we have never contended we're perfect. We need your help. We need your advice and your counsel, and we will always honour your trust. Our commitment is to Canada, and our commitment is to you. Together, we're going to build a new day for Canada and for all of you. Thank you, Mr. Mulroney. Mr. Turner, please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, we need, I need your help on September 4th. I need your help to allow me, with my party and a new government, to set a new direction for Canada. I came back to public life to reestablish our confidence, our confidence in ourselves, our confidence in the limitless potential of this great country, a confidence that seems to have disappeared 
but I know can be renewed. And if it does, that investment will come. And with that investment, expansion. And with that expansion, jobs. And I want, with your help, to lead a national government, every region of the country being involved, bringing the West in as true partners in Confederation as part of our decision-making process. I want a new harmony between Ottawa and the provinces. I mean a strong federal government, yes, but I mean a government that responds and recognizes the illegitimate rights of our provinces. I've said on many occasions that I want to re reach out to organized labor, because if we are going to become competitive again as a country, resisting the ferocious uh, competition that uh, reaches us from every quarter of the world, then we must together become more efficient. We must enhance the quality and style of work. We must give youth a first chance for a job. We need a national training and apprenticeship program. We need to help our young people put some experience on their resume so when they go for a job, they have something to show a prospective employer. We have to advance the cause of equality and economic equality for women in Canada. Equal pay for work of equal value. Affirmative action programs which really mean that there is equality of access to jobs of every kind and promotional opportunities and career options. We are all minorities in Canada. There's no majority minority anymore. We are all minorities. And uh, I respect and and, 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 and uh, an enriched in heritage for, uh, for all of us. We should all remember where we came from and be proud of where we came from. But my, my goal for Canada is total accessibility of all the cultural mosaic of this country into the mainstream of our Canadian life. And I undertake to protect the minorities that build up this country. And I speak, too, of our, our Native peoples. I want to help them move with dignity towards more self-reliance and self-government. I want to give our elderly a dignified retirement. Pension reform is long overdue. Care for the chronically ill in Canada is inadequate, and we have very little research on aging. To achieve all of this, we need sound and better management of our economy. I believe I have the experience to bring this to, and make it happen. I know that by working together as Canadians, by pulling together once again as Canadians, we can make it happen. And I need your support on September 4th. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Mr. Broadbent will be our final speaker. I want to conclude my remarks with this observation. You will have heard uh, Mr. Halton uh, ask both Mr. Turner and Mr. Mulroney a long time ago if they could indicate some clear differences between them. I listened with a great deal of care, as I'm sure you did, and I frankly got nothing except Mr. Turner and Mr. Moroni attacking each other about their respective integrity on the one hand, or who was more or less responsible for an increasing or diminishing deficit, as the case may be. I, I know, frankly, that if you look at the policies of both of them, and if you listen to this debate, what Mr. Moroni he said himself in a, an interview on an Ottawa newspaper a couple of weeks ago is perfectly true. Mr. Mulroney said there isn't a single idea that's been proposed by Mr. Turner that couldn't be found in his book. That is to say that they are virtually identical, and it's been demonstrated day in and day out in Parliament. I wish every Canadian could see the voting record in the House of Commons. The Conservative Party since 1980 has voted twice as often in the House of Commons with the Liberals as the New Democratic Party though Mr. Mulroney would like to leave you with a contrary impression. You know, what this election is, is really about, as I, I find it so far tonight, is about two things. One is about integrity on the one hand, and I regret to say that, uh, related to the question of consistency. I don't know about you out there, but I find it very bothersome indeed to hear politicians, to hear Mr. Turner and Mr. Mulroney say, oh yes, we have to be concerned about the deficit and go on at great length with wonderful woolly phrases designed, frankly, I think, to con you, and then simultaneously talk about government programs. Well, I know those government programs cost money. I know that you can't have it both ways, 
And I have a feeling that people of this country are getting sick and tired of that. They want a little decency. They want a little straightforward talk. And it's long overdue in this nation. And leading the new Democratic Party, I want to say to you, I intend to talk straight. We aren't going to pretend to be all things to all people. And I want, having put that aside, to say what I think this election ought to be about. That when you vote on September 4th, in your heart of hearts, you should look at the parties and look at the leaders and what they're saying and say, whether you're a Canadian of Ukrainian ancestry or German or French, whether you live in British Columbia or Atlantic Canada, whether you're a native Canadian or a new Canadian, you are what I describe, frankly, as an ordinary Canadian, and that's what I went into politics all about. You should say, now, do those men who are leading those parties, do they promise serious tax justice? Do they promise something other than general phrases for equality for women? Are they prepared to act now? Or do they just want to con people? Are they really prepared for young people to, to give concrete programs, as we've announced in the past two weeks, to give them some hope and confidence? You know, the, the future is one that can be great and decent and open and more de democratic. It won't be utopia by any party that's elected. There will always be some difficulties. There will always be some conflicts. But by God, certain parties are prepared to speak frankly about what they would do. They're prepared to talk about the costs. And they don't want to be all things to all people. And the party I lead in particular wants to see men and women elected on September 4th who will go to the Parliament of Canada and stand up for the ordinary man or woman who will vote that way consistently, who will do in Parliament what he or she talks about now. That's the kind of future we believe in. If you elect new Democrats, I think the ordinary person in this country is going to have his or interests well served. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Broadbent. Gentlemen, again, I regret our up. May I thank the leaders of each of the parties for being here tonight and for this contribution to our democratic process. Gentlemen of the press, thank you, too, for framing the issues so well. I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of yours, indeed all Canadians, in commending all of you here for this interesting and useful exchange of views and for an opportunity for all of us to see democracy in action, sometimes quite vigorously, but certainly very thoughtfully. And to you, the audience, thank you for being with us tonight. Good evening.